Hi, I'm Zivi Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Itaf Ram is the author of Evil Eye, a novel. Itaf was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York by Palestinian immigrants. She has taught English literature in North Carolina, where she lives with her two children. Itaf also runs the Instagram account at Books and Beans and is a Book of the Month Club ambassador. Welcome, Itaf. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I can't even pronounce my own show, but that's fine. (laughs) To discuss A Woman is No Man and evil eye. So thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's my pleasure. I know I I first reached out to you through Claire Gibson, who I had gotten to know and knew you, I think from your neighborhood and I don't even know. So, and I think I told you back then how much of a fan my mother is of you and all of your work. So I just had to put her name out there so she could be really happy. (laughs) Send her all my love. It's such, <laughs> so, it's such a blessing to hear that. Of course, she's not the only one. You're a New York Times bestselling author, blah, blah, blah. But you know, priorities. Got to start with the family. I just wanted to kick off this episode by reading a tiny bit from the beginning of A Woman Is No Man because it's so striking. And people who might not be familiar with you yet might not know what your voice is like. And this is particularly voice related. So I just wanted to read even this opening. Is that okay? Like a sentence or two so to give yeah. a little preview. Did you want me to read it? Oh, I was going to read it. Do you want to read it? No, you read it. No, I'll be quick. So this is how a woman is no man starts for anyone who has not read it yet. I was born without a voice one cold overcast day in Brooklyn, New York. No one ever spoke of my condition. I did not know I was mute until years later when I opened my mouth to ask for what I wanted and realized no one could hear me. Where I come from, voicelessness is the condition of my gender, as normal as the bosoms on a woman's chest, as necessary as the next generation growing inside her belly. But we will never tell you this, of course. Where I come from, we've learned to conceal our condition. We've been taught to silence ourselves, that our silence will save us. It is only now, many years later, that I know this to be false. Only now, as I write this story, do I feel my voice coming. You've never heard this story before, no matter how many books you've read, how many tales you know, believe me, no one has ever told you a story like this one. Okay. So with that, <laughs> you're, you're setting the expectations very, very high. You know? <laughs> why would I do that? <laughs> I'm listening to you and I'm like, why would I? <laughs> no. no, it's amazing. It's amazing. You want your, you know, to be immersed in a world like this. Okay. Let's back up. First of all, your latest book, congratulations. Why don't you tell listeners about that? And then I want to go back to this book and talk about voice and uh, voice throughout your books, honestly. So yes. So my latest book, Evil Eye comes out September 5th. It's about a Arab American woman, mother of two, who has worked really hard to escape the demons of her past, is highly educated, is in the art field, and thinks that she has a life that is very different than the life of the women that she's seen growing up, the powerless women that she's seen. And after an incident at work, her mom tells her that she might be cursed with a curse that's been in their family for generations. And all of a sudden, Yara, our main character, is now questioning everything she thought she knew about her life, her future, and if she's ever really escaped the past. I mean, can we really escape the past? Yeah, can we? So we're on this journey to figure out, you know, what are the decisions that need to be made for this character? And I read you saying that this came from a personal place, part of this story. Tell me about that. Yeah, both my novels come from a personal place. I'm a Palestinian American woman. I was born and raised in this country to Palestinian immigrants. And so 
Both of my novels are set in the Arab American community. Both of them feature characters that we don't often see in bookstores, uh, minority women, uh, women who have been taught that a woman's role is confined in the home as a mother. And these women are now looking back at their lives and questioning well, what, what parts of tradition and culture do I resonate with and what parts have, have I been uh, perpetuating and passing on that I that don't really resonate with me and what can we do from here? So in, in that regard, I think both novels do come from an autobiographical place. Not just from for me as a woman, as a Palestinian American woman, but I think it reflects many women in cultures or in societies or in families that feel like they have to play a certain role and then figuring out, well, then who am I really? Yes. Which is sort of a blanket for many, yes. many, yes. <laughs> many people trying to figure out who we are and our place in the world and all of that. If you were writing a memoir now, how would it differ? What, and when did you realize that this part of your identity is something you wanted to explore through fiction? I realized it. In in 2016, I was teaching full-time at a community college. I was teaching American literature and English 111, just like writing. And I realized that as an Arab American woman, our stories were not present in bookshelves, in bookstores, and in literature in general, we were underrepresented. At that very same time that I was teaching, I was also going through a hard time personally in my life just questioning like how I had gotten to the point that I was at and why despite all of my accomplishment, I still felt really empty and I still felt like I was pretending, like I was playing a role. And I had obviously succeeded at the role I was teaching. I had a master's degree. I had children. Everything was perfect. I managed to hold on to my culture and to my American dreams, right? But something was really wrong. And so it was the combination of being in the classroom and teaching and realizing how little of my identity and my community is in this country, is seen in this country for what it really is and not just, oh, the terrorists on the news or Palestine is being bombed and outside of that, like the domestic lives of these women, what do they look like? So I wanted to portray that and I wanted it to be accessed easily. And then I also had... A lot of questions myself about how I got here and what, who am I? And as a woman, where are my limits? And I wanted to explore all that through fiction. I thought it was, I thought it was cathartic for me as someone that was depressed and going through this difficult time. But also, I wanted to use that pain to get answers for myself, but hopefully to help someone else that could possibly be in my position if they read the story and resonated with it, if it could give them some clarity, because at that point I felt like I did not have any clarity or guidance. And did it work? Yes. It It was hard and uncomfortable and ugly and messy, but it helped writing A Woman Is No Man and even writing Evil Eye helped me pierce into some truths that I couldn't really pierce through in memoir. We don't look at ourselves objectively, I think. We're so much in denial and there's so many facades and layers of pretending and layers of conditioning and programming, especially uh, when you come from these strict societies and cultures. I had so many layers of trauma and, and just so many facades to unpeel. And I could not do that in memoir. I did not have the courage to do that in memoir. Whereas with fiction, I felt, okay, I know what I want to find and I know that I'm looking for truth and I can look for it at my, my pace with these characters that I'm pretending are characters, but they really are are people in my mind, voices in my head that I can use to work through some things and get through a place of, of healing. And I think that the, that both those books, because they were fiction, helped me find healing. Hmm. That's amazing. So what are you what do you need healing on now? Are you working on something else? <laughs> Don't we all need healing? <laughs> Isn't yes. it never end? I'm working on healing myself through the aging process. I'm going to delve deep for that into fiction and see how I feel about it. <laughs> you're beautiful. I don't know what you're talking about. No, but. no. You know. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Your smile is so radiant. You, are, oh. you look lovely. Thank you. So. I just, we're all working through something. We're all working. Exactly. We're all working through something. And it's, I don't know. 
just much in the same way that reading helps us escape and work through emotional problems with different characters. Yes. For writers, that writing process is just, you know, it's just as powerful. So true. So were you surprised then after writing your first book? And I'm curious when you found time to do that, when you were still teaching, I'm assuming you're still teaching and parenting and all the rest and how you felt once that sort of hit big and then where you found the time to write Evil Eye and like, could you still protect your sanity in trying to write a second book? Oh my God. Evil Eye. Well, first of all, great question. Evil Eye was really challenging. So after Woman is When Man Got Written, I wrote it just very quickly. I wrote it in between classes or on my lunch break or in the mornings, I'd wake up really early and I would write before the kids went to school. I'd take them to school, go to work, do my routine and find some times to write. And I will say that, I will say that A Woman is a Man wrote itself. That novel, like my heart cracked open and everything just came out. It was years and years and years of memories. Um, it started off, it started out as a journal entry. So a lot of it was memories, direct memories and things that I was working through that, you know, it just poured out of me. But Evil Eye was, it was a COVID novel. So when A Woman is a Man came out, it was 2019. I went on tour. I came back 2020, you know, end of 2019. I'm like, all right, it's time to start writing. I I could do this. I still have more to say, right? And then COVID happened and a woman is no man blew up at the same time. So I had this imposter syndrome, like, wait a minute, I can't write anything that's going to level up, that's going to match the level of success that this novel has gotten. And also I was, it was COVID and I was running, my, my children were home from school. I was running businesses with my husband that I had to, you know, either close down or there was a lot going on and the world was, I don't need to explain to you what has happening in the world, but I will say that it was harder to write this novel because I had the first novel. And then also I hadn't worked through as much as I thought I had in terms of inner work, like I had, but there was more layers Mm -hmm. and this novel was showing me the layers (laughs) and I didn't like it. I didn't like it. And I got depressed. This is probably a bit too personal for this. No, no, I love the personal. Keep going. No, I mean, I got depressed. It was COVID. I was depressed because I just felt alone and I was hurting for this world that I created in both novels and for, you know, just the women that go through this, the specific women in my mind, in my life and other women you know, on a separate note, like I get a lot of DMs from women that read A Woman Is No Man and say, you know, this book has really changed my life or I really never looked at it like, you know, in this way. And I, now I have the courage to talk to my mom or to talk to my sister or, you know, to take certain steps because they were able to work through some emotional pain in the novel. So I think that responsibility was now even clearer because when I was writing A Woman Is No Man, it was just for me to write out that story. And it was the idea of helping people and 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 helping people find some sort of resonance with the work. But then when you know that, that they have found resonance and now you have to do it again, it just really scared me. So that was the difference between the two. So what did you do on the moments that you were most doubting yourself and it was just you and the screen? I just told myself to keep going. I knew that if I didn't push through it, that I had worked so hard to get to that moment where I had a a place and a paper and a pen and and an ability to reach people. And I knew that even if it wasn't what I wanted it to be and it didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to turn out, the fact that I was here was an immense privilege. Like I am constantly reminded of my immense privilege when I think about women all over the world that are living in far less circumstances, children in Palestine that are being bombed, people that are feeling unsafe every day, that are that don't have access to food or, or clean water, that, that 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 can't go to school. You know, I have so much in my life. And so I think that was that's the thought that always comes when I'm having a dark moment is I made it here. My parents brought me to this country. Like I was able to get an education. I got myself here. And so I need to keep going. And, and quickly, and quickly that, I don't know if it's survival mode, I don't know, but it, it pushes me to complete the day. It's almost like guilting yourself into it. <laughs> you better do this right now. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> okay. Wait, I want to pivot for one second and talk about your bookstore. How, when did that come into the equation? That came into the equation at the end of 2019, right before COVID. I was so excited about the opportunity to open up a spot in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, where I live, where I can create a space for people to just gather. I live in a small town, so we don't have many places here where you can come and grab a cup of coffee, browse through a book, a small library. We have so many diverse books on our shelf, in our library, and on our for sale shelf that I wanted to create that space here. And so that happened in 2019. And I just came back from there. And it's exciting. It's exciting to see people come in and watch what books they choose to buy and, you know, kind of judge them a little bit like, all right, this is what you like. You know, just, <laughs> it's, it's it's really nice. And, and to know that a lot of like someone's choosing to spend their time in that space. Someone's choosing to go have dinner. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, go have a coffee before dinner or just go sit down and read. The girls will come in and just sit there and read. And to me, I'm thinking this is the best that there's a space here for you to do that. Oh, awesome. So I started a bookstore also this year. Really? Um, Santa Monica. Yeah. Called Zippy's Bookshop. I'm wearing the sweatshirt today, which I wear all the time. Although Congratulations. I this is my husband's. But yeah, it's the most fun and rewarding and amazing thing to like put yourself at the center of this, you know, literary connection fest, essentially, and just watch people as they browse and ask questions and then what they pick and yeah. how they interact with everybody else in the store. I, I I think it is the most amazing thing. I think everybody should spend an entire day in a small bookstore and just like yes. watch and listen. Yes. It's it's so intimate because there's nowhere to go and People are just coming to either escape or for personal growth or for just some time for self-care time. And you, you're there watching and aiding in that. So it's, it's so rewarding. Like you said, it's really nice. But somehow you have like a bazillion followers on books and beans and I have like none (laughs) for my store that I just started. How did you grow that following? That's actually the reason why I had, I have so many followers is because I started the account when I started writing A Woman Is No Man. And it was, it was years before I'd ever opened the store. And so the following was more, it was my personal account that I was going to bookstores and talking about books and, you know, getting quotes of books that I like with coffee. And it started in 2000. 16. So I it was before the algorithm and Instagram changed. So if you were to ask me right now, like, how, how do you do that? I would tell you, I have no idea because <laughs> this was before reels before it was easier, I think to grow back then because there weren't many people on Instagram. Kind of like more like the threads of today or something just starting out. Yeah. Maybe, although not really. But anyway, would you ever open a second store? Have people asked you to expand? And would you, I don't know, would you? Well, people have asked me to expand in different states or in other locations here in town. But I don't think that, no, I wouldn't, I guess is the answer. Yeah. I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not, I think that I'm just such a creative and a person that wants to explore. And I think that it's hard with businesses because you have to run the business and with the way the world is now and the lack of help in for businesses. And it's, it's hard to find staff to help. So I think that would be, I would love to, like, I have the vision to open so many things, but practically I don't think I would because I would, I don't have the the time. When do you find time to read? I find time to read at night or sometimes I'll just go like take a 30 minute break and read during my day. Like if I have a block of time and I don't know what to do with it, I'll go have a cup of coffee or something and I'll just read. But even that's, it's even hard finding time to read. Like I have to schedule in or make it part of my like nightly routine. All right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go brush my teeth, 
sit down and just read and then go to bed. You know, I'll have to, I have to tell myself these are the times because throughout the day, there's, there's just so much to do. Yeah. I seem to have gotten reading in, like I'd always read before bed. Now I'm trying to teach my kids, you know, and it was so sweet last night. My daughter, when I went to like straighten up her room this morning, which she should have done herself. I know I'm like a bad mom, but anyway, whatever. But I found her, her book was like right there on her bed. You know, she hadn't, she had fallen asleep with it right there. And I was like, this is like a dream come true. It is. It's so important to teach kids that it's so important reading, teaching your kids to love reading or to enjoy it at least is the best thing you can do for a child, in my opinion, is the most, it, it teaches them so many things. Yeah. Then they wanted to stay up reading the other night. And I was like, how can I contradict myself by making yeah. them go to bed and put down the book? I, all I do is try to get them to pick up books. This is the one time. And I'm like, okay, fine. Stay up till midnight yeah. and read. I don't even care. <laughs> exactly. 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 You're like, all right, I'm, I'm going to bed I'm now. Right, now. right now I'm being a hypocrite, but it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> How about your kids? Are they readers or have yeah, you had trouble with it? Yeah. Yeah. My daughter, we were on, we were at the beach yesterday and at the beach house, there was a new selection. There was a, a selection of books and I like go right in and I go into the books and I'm going through them. Oh, this person has such good taste in books. <laughs> there's Flannery O'Connor in there. There was an Elizabeth Gilbert book in there. There was, oh my God, the book that I made her read. And now I can't remember it. I completely forgot. Anyways, she read the whole book in the day, in a day. Wow. How old are your kids? He's 14 and my son is 11. They're they're both readers. Awesome. Are you working on a new book now and are you feeling depressed now or how do you feel in general at this point? No, the the depression was more of like a COVID thing. Like I just felt trapped with this novel and I couldn't go out and I just had this novel. (laughs) I'm not currently working on anything. I'm taking some time to figure out what I want to work on. That is maybe a little bit different. I feel like both A Woman is Domain and Evil Eye are heavy. And I want to work on something a little less dark next time. So I know that if I start a book now from this place, I won't give it the attention that it needs in terms of like, what do I want to write about? It's not a good place right now for me, at least. Okay. Are you excited about going? Are you going out on the road? I'm sure to tons of places for Evil Eye. What is that going to be like? Yeah. So the book comes out in September. So I officially start going on tour then. But for now, I have been just doing a bunch of interviews and podcasts, and that's been really exciting. Like knowing, all right, this is this is a real book now. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not in my head anymore. It's out in the world, and people are reading it, and it's it's exciting to get to the stage. It's so exciting. Amazing. What advice do you have for aspiring authors? Keep writing every single day. If you can make it a priority to put your thoughts on, on paper. I think discipline is the most, the best advice I can give. And with discipline, after you've mastered yourself, because that yourself is the number one person that's going to get in your way. And the number one person that's going to help you succeed. And so often we self-sabotage. We say, oh, I want to do something. And then we'll think of a million reasons why we can't do it that day. Or it's easy, at least for me, I realize that there's there's a voice in my head that wants to, to procrastinate if I let it. And so I've learned to like master that. That's That's huge. And to just keep going. And I think that's, yeah, that's that, that that's why I say like when people are like what advice do you give? Really, it's it's managing yourself, learning how to discipline yourself, learning how to be in charge of yourself and not let your mind be in charge of you. And I think that just goes on to it covers many things, including being authentic and writing authentically. Because a lot of times we're writing and we think we have to write a specific story or tell it in a specific way, and it's about people pleasing and market pleasing and. Or even I'm writing because I want to, to hit the list or I'm writing because I want to sell for this amount. And all of those reasons are not the reason to write. And so asking yourself, like, why am I writing? What about this story? What about these words or this process? What's, at the, what's the truth here that I'm trying to get at? Because that truth is what's going to help you be disciplined because it means more than hitting a list. You can't control that, you know? You can't control hitting the list. You can't control getting fame and whatever external motivator people have to achieve goals. Like those external circumstances 
are very shallow and superficial. I think if we dig deep and look for like the authentic reasons why we're doing things, it can help us do that thing better, make it more noble, not noble, but impactful because it's a real, it's a real thing. It's not another performance. Hey, Taft, this has been so nice. I want to come see your bookstore. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, how do I get to, where, do, where, how do you even get to your store? Do you, where do you fly into? You fly into Raleigh, in North Carolina. And then how far is and it? And have you ever been to North Carolina? Yes. Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then it's an hour away from the airport. It's in a town called Rocky Mount. You can look it up. Yeah, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. My brother went to Duke. So I was down okay. there and yeah, been to like, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's like when people say UNC Chapel Hill or Duke, it's like you have to look around the room to see. Oh, sorry. Should I not I mean, have said that? <laughs> no, no. Not, I mean, I don't, have a, I don't have a preference for either. Okay. I, it's just it's just a North Carolina thing. So okay. You just know this people here like, what? Duke? <laughs> it, he just went there for law school. So I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. <laughs> anyway. Well, good luck with your release. I'm so excited for you and I hope to stay in touch. And if you want to come to LA and do an event at our bookstore, we have events all the time. If you have any interest in getting out West or you are already going to be out there, it's in Santa Monica. It's really cute. So oh, I would love to, um, I can share my publicist information really. Like if I get invited somewhere, my publisher will send me there. So if okay. you have an, yeah, like there, we'll yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if, if you think, you want to do like an event at your bookstore or yes. something. Yeah. That'd be cool. That'd be great. Okay. Amazing. Okay. All right. It was great to talk to you. Great bye. to talk to you. Okay. Bye. bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.